Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Javier Arias, who's a senior developer at Telefonica uh, in Barcelona, here in Spain. And he's going to be talking about machine learning for dumi dummies using Python, of course. Hi. Uh, do you hear me well? They're in the back. Yeah, it's OK. OK, if not, please let me know, because if I lower my voice, let me, let me check part of the contest, of the photos, because full is, uh, it's also for my mama. <laughs> OK. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. This uh, could be a day in your life. This could be today. It's about time to leave the office, and your phone tells you the best route to go home. It's fine because you never told your phone where home is or what's the appropriate time to leave the office. In fact, on Fridays, the phone will tell you the best route to your, to your parents' home, because on Fridays, you visit your parents. So you go to a parking, and you happen to be a happy Tesla owner. Not that everybody of us can beat, but let's imagine for a minute. In the, in the latest version of the firmware's car, <clears throat> there is an autopilot feature. With autopilot, the car is able to keep the lane by moving the steering wheel, keep the speed and the distance with the rest of the cars. And not only that, the car is able to learn not only from its own experiences, but from experiences from the Teslas from around the world. So you get home and you want to play some music. But you don't feel like choosing any music, so you trust on Spotify to play some music for you that you don't know, but you actually know, uh, like. <clears throat> While listening to the music, you check your photos, which are very well organized in, category, in categories like here with architecture and arts. But you never tag them. It was Flickr that is able to look inside your photos and see what's inside and tag them accordingly. These things are happening daily to thousands or even millions of people from around the world. And all of them have something in common. Do you know what it is? It's machine learning. Machine learning is already in your life. It's everyone around us, and it will be very important in the next years. <clears throat> so what's this presentation about? I'll try to explain a, li a little bit why machine learning is so important for us as users, as engineers, and for companies, and for the rest of the world. <laughs> also, I'll try to explain about my journey with machine learning. My name is Javier Arias, and I'm, I am a back-end engineer. Six months ago, I didn't know anything about machine learning, and I'm not an expert. Uh, it would be, it would be neat years of study and practice to do so. But you can get started pretty quick and do very interesting and funny things because there are many technologies and many resources around that are free, that are open source, and of course using Python and libraries with Python. And also I'll try to explain some very basic machine learning concepts. And we'll see a couple of code samples. So, as many of you know, machine learning will be very important during the next years. But one of the first questions that came to my mind when starting with it is, is really machine learning uh, intelligent? Are these algorithms already better than us? And the response is that in some concrete questions, in some concrete aspects, Machines and algorithms are already better than us. One example of that is image recognition. 
ImageNet is hosting a yearly challenge on machine learning, on image recognition, and the performance of the winner algorithms have been improving a lot during the last years, thanks to the adoption of deep learning and this kind of technologies. In 2015, the winner algorithm performed better than human at recognizing things inside images. Something happened, something similar happened to chess about 20 years ago when IBM's Deep Blue defeated the world champion Gary Kasparov. I remember vividly reading about this in the news and reading it on the newspaper. It was 20 years ago, maybe. That's why some colleagues tell me that I'm a senior developer. But, <laughs> but, but there are, there, it was quite a milestone at the time. But there are other games that are much more complex than chess. For example, the game of Go. The game of Go is so complex that the number of movements is bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. For such a complex game, it was thought, uh, for such a complex game, it's very important to play with intuition. And for that reason, many people thought that algorithms could never win the champions. Until this spring, when AlphaGo by Google defeated the world champion, Lee Seedol. This thing, algorithms being better than us in concrete tasks are happening more and more frequently. And for that reason, many people are making ap apocalyptic predictions on the moment that machines will be more intelligent than us. It <clears throat> it's the singularity point. But, okay, I don't want to be so apocalyptic. I want to talk to you about my journey. As I said, six months ago, I didn't know anything about machine learning, and I thought that it would take weeks or months of study just to get started. But that's not true. If you are a dummy like me, you don't know anything about machine learning, you can get started, and in a little bit of time, you can get very useful and very surprising things, at least for me. When I started, I decided to study, uh, not by using courses or books, but by using massive open online courses. And these courses have uh, videos and exercises, and there are different providers. There are forums where you can discuss with other people about the things you are doing. And there are many different providers, so you have to do res your research here. What I chose was the Udacity Introduction to Machine Learning, but it could be any other one, which would fit for you. It's very well organized and is using Python and Scilearn, and this was a plus for me. And also, for me, it was very important that you can do it at your, at your own pace, because I, don't, I can't stick to, to deadlines. So this was a plus for me. And one thing that caught my attention was the subtitle, which is pattern recognition for fun and profit. I can imagine about the profit, but what about the fun? And the course starts like this. A couple of friends sharing a bottle of wine, not bad, <laughs> and and it ends like this, with the same friends and more wine. So it seems that machine learning can also be fun, after all. So what is machine learning? I want to explain uh, very basic concepts uh, and some insights that many times are not well explained or just overlooked when you start with machine learning. And I think that there are things that are important, at least, at least for me, and I want to share them with you. Of course, this is not a short course, and you should learn and read books and do courses and these things, but uh, when we work in machine learning, we want to solve a complex problem. So we have something here in the middle, and you show, you have some inputs, which is the data, in machine learning is features, and we have to do a prediction, which is the outcome of this thing here in the middle. The first approach, the classical approach, is programming. Probably all of us here know how to program, so you have to understand your problem, and you have to explain it step by step, in baby steps to the computer, so that it can follow your steps to achieve the, the, the solution. But the problem is that for very complex domains, such as image recognition, 
uh, medicine, these kind of things, this doesn't scale because uh, let's, let's imagine that we have to solve something for medicine. Medicine, maybe you have to code thousands of, and thousands of, of, of rules and these rules are not exact because medicine is not an exact science. So maybe you have conflicts and you have to solve them and it's very difficult to solve. <clears throat> but if you use machine learning, the approach is totally different. Instead of explaining the computer what are the steps to solve the problem, you show the computer some real world data, some examples of data, and you let, you let the algorithm learn and take its own conclusions from the data. This has huge implications, and it's that we can teach computers to do things that we don't know how to do. And I'll show you that in some minutes. So, I, I'll try to explain from a user point of view. I'm not going to enter into mathematical details because I studied uh, mathematics something like 23 years ago, and I, I, I couldn't remember, but I, I'll try to explain in, in, from the point of view of users how machine learning works at a, at a high level. And we will solve an example for character recognition. So we will have thousands of images like this. Each one is containing a character, a letter. And we will have the li labels telling us that the first letter is an F, the second an E, and so on. So the first step in machine learning is getting our data. We have that blue image that corresponds to an F there, the yellow image, which is a G, and so on. Second step is to choose an algorithm. Lorena, in the talk before this, was talking about naive Bayes, but there are many, many tens or maybe hundreds of algorithms are out there. There is super vector machines or k-means, decision trees, neural networks, many of them. And you have to choose. And there are different algorithms that can be a good fit for your project. And also, these algorithms can be configured. So you have to choose a combination of algorithms and configuration. So this is part of the machine learning art. And then you train your algorithm. For training the algorithm, you start by showing some images, and you say, okay, this, is, this blue image is an F, and this yellow image is a G, and so on. In some respect, it's like, it's like showing a, a, a baby to read. It's like teaching a baby to read. First step is to get predictions. So you show new data to the algorithm, and it will tell you, okay, I think this is a D. But the tricky question here is, is that letter really a D? Is our algorithm predicting correctly the, the letters inside? We will answer this question later. <clears throat> so we have a lot of tools, and we have different languages, such as uh, MATLAB and R, but here we're going to talk about Python, of course. And I don't have to sell here the beauty of Python, but it's a very good fit, and it's following its own philosophy of batteries included. There are many, many libraries with very good quality that will help you to solve problems very easily. And we will solve the character recognition problem using Python, and sklearn is one of the most popular libraries out there. It's open source with Python, and the documentation is wonderful, not just for the library, but just as a reference of algorithms and methodologies and everything. And sklearn gives support to the full life cycle of machine learning. So we will solve, solve this problem. We will do the, the following steps. We will get the features with labels. We already have the data. We will choose and configure an algorithm. We will be using logistic regression with no configuration. We will train the algorithm. Then we will do predictions, 
and then we will validate them. So let's get started with the example. We have this big data set here, it's thousands of images with the labels. We want to separate them in two different data sets. One data set is for training, the other is for testing, for validating our results. And we will use train test split function from sklearn, and we will split our data set and labels. We will give a size for our training data set. The size matters, but uh, we will not explain why here. And there is a random state that happens to be a constant. And it, this shocked me in the, in the very beginning. Why the hell are we giving a random state that happens to be a constant? And the answer is that the train test split will separate our big data set in a random set of images for the training and the test. But by passing this constant, the selection of images for each data set will be the same always, so that we can compare different configuration of the algorithms or different algorithms. Then we initialize our algorithm, logistic regression, no configuration, and we do the fit. The fit is the training, and we pass the training data set and the labels. This is the part with, where we teach the baby to read, but it's very easy. We don't have to iterate and do things. Uh, sklearn does it for us. To do predictions, we just call the predict function on our classifier, and that's all. But the question is if our predictions were good or bad. To solve this question, we will use accuracy. There are many different ways in machine learning, but we will use accuracy since it's the simplest one and we don't have time for more. Uh, so what we do is do predictions on our test data set and we have some test predictions. What we do is compare the test labels, which is the ground truth, the things that we know are truth, to the test pre predictions. And this way we know the percentage of images that we have been predicting correctly. With this example I just gave you, we got 89% of accuracy. This means that of 500, 5,000 images, we're predicting, well, 90% almost, in just five lines of code. And this is what I mentioned before. I, I, I never did image recognition or image processing. It would take me weeks or months to implement such a thing without machine learning. And we did it here in 20 minutes together. <clears throat> of course, we can improve these results. We can play with training data, as Lorena from the previous uh, talk mentioned before. We can change the algorithm and the configurations. And this is very easy using sklearn because the APIs for the different algorithms is almost the same. And you can give sklearn different configurations for one algorithm and it will test all the different configurations and give you the best one. <coughs> So, uh, we already seen this very simple example with uh, classical machine learning. Currently, I'm doing uh, another course at Udacity of deep learning. I just did the very first lesson and we did, I did the first exercise of couple of exercises and I want to present them to you because I think that it's uh, part of code that you more or less can understand. I'm not going to explain neural ne networks, and please don't ask it, because I don't know anything about it. But I think that you can get an intuition on how we are going to structure the code. So this is the course I'm still doing, so I'm going to run. We will use uh, TensorFlow, which is a library by Google, and who is the author of the course as well. And it seems that uh, deep learning is not so fun because there is no wine in the course for the moment, but I'm still in the first two lessons. I, I will, I keep my, my hope. So we will be using TensorFlow and I'll jump directly to the code. The difference between sklearn and 
uh, TensorFlow is that uh, sklearn is using an imperative API. And in TensorFlow, what you do is describe a set of mathematical operations in a kind of graph. And then you execute uh, that graph with your, with your data. So you have to know what are the mathematical operations to implement your uh, neural network. So please don't make questions about this. But this is the simplest possible neural network in the world. This is a two layers neural network. And the, here in the left, we have an image, x. And there on the right, on your right, yeah. Uh, we have a prediction. The prediction is a matrix with a, a set of probabilities for each letter. So we will put pick the letter with more probability. And the implementation is very easy. The image is a matrix, and we will do the matrix multiplied by a matrix of weights, and we, we will add another matrix, which is the bias, and we will apply a ReLU function, which is, is a kind of filter. This is what I understood from the first lesson. And you have then, you are making a pipe. The, the, the result from each one is going to be piped to the next. And then we go to the second layer, which is again a matrix multiplication, an addition of a bias, and we will get uh, a matrix of uh, weights. And then we will do a softmax, which is a function that transforms a set of weights in a set of probabilities. So the implementation, it's very simple. It's, uh, if you remember, uh, you have, remember, please. Uh, wh what we do is, uh, we do a, a multiplication of matrices of our test data set with the first uh, matrix of weights for the first layer, and we add the biases. This is level one, layer one logits, and then we apply the ReLU on the layer one logits, and we will have the output for the first layer. Then we repeat, we uh, do the matrix multiplication, and then the addition, and then, whoop, and then we apply the softmax over the output of the previous operation. And this is the implementation of a simple neural network. This is the production neural network you have to train it so that you can have these different uh, matrices with correct values for your problem. And it's much more complex. And maybe next year I, I will explain that. So this is what I wanted to, to share with you. Uh, the idea is that I, I'll do a, a very quick summary. Machine learning is here in, is already in our lives. And it will become very important for everybody. So if you are a dummy like me, machine learning, don't be afraid. You can do very funny things with the resources and tools that we have there outside and with very good quality, free open source to use. And you can do very funny things. So if you want to use them and do interesting things, just do it for your own profit and of course for fun. Thank you. Time for questions. Analysis uh, neural networks are known to uh, to be um, uh, 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 a lot of time. What are your experience? Uh, experience using Python. No, it, no, it, 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 it's not as fast as as uh, C plus plus. plus. Um, uh, thank you for the question. Dick. So, um, my in my experience. Uh, the question is that 
uh, as I understand the question, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, the, the question is that uh, how compares uh, the, the performance from the first example and from the second, and also what, how compares that with the performance with other languages, such as C++. And the response is very easy for me, because I'm not sure what to answer, but uh, in my experience, uh, the, the, the performance of the, of the, at least for, for these neural networks, is more than, is more than enough. And there, there have been many advances in last year with the adoption of, um, of uh, graphic, graphic process, GPUs and, and, and different algorithms. For example, the ReLU function we are using here instead of sino, sinusoidal functions uh, have made possible to train very complex uh, networks. In, in any case, I, I don't know how it compares with C++ or others, but what is sure that if you want to train very complex models, you will need uh, very, very uh, expensive hardware. But you can play with it with uh, just a small laptop, in my experience. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I also have a small question. Like, there are a lot of uh, tools with different level of support, for example, which provide basically API for machine learning, like API.ai, Watson from IBM, something from Google. My question is, have you used them? And is it worth to play around with them? For example, for text recognition, they do a lot of interesting stuff as well as they claim to. Mm -hmm. Or is it better to just develop something on your own? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with that system. So I just, some weeks ago, I did a, a small prototype of a, of a, a chatbot using uh, natural language processing libraries from Microsoft in that case. And my experience is that uh, these models are already very well trained for very specific purposes. And if you have the time and money and your, if your core business, probably it's better for you to train your own models and have people specialized. If it's a, some side thing, it's not main core business, you don't have the money, probably these already built uh, models are more than good enough for you, but uh, for very specific things, you will don't have uh, already trained things. But it's my, it's my experience. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, so at 5.15, uh, we've got some lightning talks. Otherwise, tomorrow at 9 a.m., there will be a fantastic keynote by Paul Indebrandt, who will be talking about the use of Python at Walt Disney, and I'm told it's a great talk. So I encourage you all to come. Let's thank the speakers again. Okay.